All right, how we doing today? Party people. Oh God, I don't know why I just said that. Um, time period five, industrialization and global integration. Time period five out of six in the AP World Curriculum. We are almost there. And time period six is pretty short too, 1900 to the present. Um, we're talking today mostly about three phenomena, uh, industrialization, imperialism, and revolutions. Uh, mostly um, political, although there's some social elements to that as well. So let's jump right into it. Slides aren't um, too long today. These notes shouldn't take us too long. I, I tried to cut them down and pare them down a little bit because this is the only time period that actually has four key concepts in it. All the other time periods have three. This one is so important and there is so much going on that there's actually four key concepts. So let's take a look at the uh, the historical periodization here to start. So um, why this time frame? We should always think about why the College Board chooses the dates that they do. Um, 1750 to 1900, um, what global processes, historical events, and major turning points were going on around those dates? Um, we uh, talk about this in class sometimes, but um, if you think about yourself as a time traveler and you go back to the world of 1750, what we find is that there are agricultural-based societies pretty much everywhere around the world. We have some what historians call proto-industrial societies, some like pre-industrial societies that are starting to spring up in urban areas, but for the most part, we still have agricultural-based societies like we've had for uh, thousands and thousands of years, but that's beginning to change. Also beginning to change is the way that people, uh, especially in Western Europe and the Western world, look at and attempt to explain the world around them. They're questioning political and religious authority, um, political and religious authorities which had remained largely unquestioned for a very long time. Um, the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment are two of these movements. If we were to accelerate 150 years later and hop out of our time machine without stopping in between 1750 and 1900, we would find a very different world in many places. Not all places, mind you, but many places. The West has industrialized or is in the throes of industrialization. We're talking about places like Great Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, the United States. Also Japan is industrialized as well, which has led to these uh, countries having huge portions of the world under their control. This is the height of the British Empire. Japan is starting to spread out and is beginning to attempt to conquer uh, all of Asia, which they'll really try to do in the 1930s and early 1940s. And the United States has um, become an imperial power with possessions in the Caribbean and also in the Pacific. Um, not to be... Um, Ignored is also the rise of the nation state. Throughout modern history, pre-modern history, classical history, the dominant form of organization had been the empire. This is beginning to change in 1900. And in fact, the most common form of political organization that we have in our world today called the nation state is beginning to supplant the empire around the world. So we have some pretty major changes that are happening between 1750 and 1900, especially when you consider that this is the shortest time period that we've dealt with thus far in the course. So what are these four key concepts that we have here? So key concept 5.1 is about industrialization, sometimes referred to as the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the terms are used interchangeably. They probably shouldn't be because one of the things we need to consider as historians, is whether or not industrialization was actually revolutionary, and we'll talk about that in class. What we do know is that industrialization changes a whole heck of a lot. Industrialization happens pretty much concurrently with the rise of global capitalism, and we're pretty familiar with capitalism, the idea of the free market. So we have new ways of producing goods and the economic reaction to those new ways of producing goods. So key concept 5.1, industrialization. Key concept 5.2 is imperialism, uh, European global domination and the unification of states. Imperialism, you can think of it as just colonialism on steroids. Uh, Europeans have been colonizing the world for a couple hundred years prior to 1750. 
Uh, what we start to see is around 1800, because of this, because of industrialization, Europeans are able to conquer larger swaths of the world more uh, rapidly. And so we enter into this phase that is, um, like I said, colonialism on steroids. It's, it's beginning to look different enough that people begin to call it something different in the time period, which is imperialism. Uh, nation state formation we'll also talk about uh, in 5.2, but we'll really talk about it in 5.3, uh, which is where we see uh, these revolutions, the rise of nationalism, pride in one's nation. We'll talk about what that means as we go through. Um, but the big thing here is that the traditional political systems are being challenged and in many instances overthrown. We see this in our country with the American Revolution, but probably a better example is uh, the French Revolution in 1789, as well as the revolutions of 1848. We don't just see this in the Western world either. We also see this in places like the Qing Empire, where they're dealing with the Taiping Revolution in the 1860s. Uh, and we see it in places like uh, India, where the Sepoy Mutiny and the first war of Indian independence happens in 1857. So we do see um, we do see this around the world, these challenges um, to traditional political systems. Latin America is another place in the early 1800s, which we'll take a look at. And last, key concept 5.4, pretty short um, concept, but uh, global migration. The mass movement of people following industrialization and global empires. We looked at how people are moving around the world during our last time period and time period four through things like the slave trade and indentured servitude and um, colonization to some extent, this process is going to continue and accelerate in time period five. So here we go, let's jump right into it. Key concept 5.1 is industrialization. Um, industrialization fundamentally changed how goods were produced. This should be pretty easy to understand. Uh, you only need to look at the world around you. We live in a highly industrialized society. Some might say a post-industrial society. If you think about all of the things in the room you are in currently, if you just look around at them, um, think about which ones of those things would not have existed prior to industrialization. How many of those things in the room have uh, interchangeable parts, for example. How many of the things in your room are standardized? How many of the things in your room were probably produced in a factory? How many of the things in your room were probably produced um, in some sort of uh, an assembly line fashion? These are all creations of the Industrial Revolution. So why does this happen? I mean, not surprisingly, there's a lot of reasons, and the College Board recognizes this by this super helpful and not at all vague concept. A variety of factors led to the rise of industrial production. Yeah, great, thanks. So there's a lot listed in the curriculum framework, um, and here we have them. You can feel free to pause and digest these if you would like. Um, this is probably what Jared Diamond would call geographic luck. Um, Europe is the first place, Western Europe is the first place to industrialize, um, Great Britain specifically. And if you look at the conditions for industrialization, Great Britain is located in a wonderful place to industrialize. Um, coal, iron, timber, easy access to water, um, urbanization, people moving to cities, increased agricultural productivity from their colonies as well, um, access to foreign resources, there's their colonies too, and the accumulation of capital. Great Britain has been um, getting more and more wealthy throughout the 1600s and 1700s. So you take all of these things and combine them and you have the preconditions for industrialization. Now these preconditions don't just exist in Western Europe, they exist elsewhere, um, but at the time, you know, 1750s, 1760s, 1770s, all of these conditions really only exist in Western Europe. Um, because of these conditions, we start to see new machinery that is um, being created. It's being created because uh, of a need that the people in Great Britain have. And these machines become increasingly complex, things like the steam engine and the internal combustion engine. Uh, and uh, textile machines as well. And because they become increasingly complex, uh, 
they become increasingly large, they become increasingly more expensive, and so the best place to house them is in one single large location. And uh, the, these are what we call factories. And so we see the development of the factory system. Prior to the factory system, you had what was called the outputting system, um, where people kind of created their... Oh, my alarm's going off. Hold on, I have to pause it. Woo! Disaster averted. I set an alarm for myself to remind me to, uh, to do this guided lecture. And I remembered without the alarm. Amazing things. Um, I forget where I was, so we're just going to move on. Uh, industrialization began in Britain, quickly spread to the rest of Western Europe, Belgium, France, Germany by 1850, United States, Japan, Russia by 1900. And it's going to continue to spread into time period six um, as well. And when we look at the world around us today, we see a number of um, highly industrialized societies and a number of societies that are passing through the process of industrialization, you know, places like uh, China or India good examples of, of this today. Okay, uh, Roman numeral two. Um, so this is kind of like effects of, um, of industrialization. I mean, there's a lot of effects of industrialization, but one of them is that we see further integration of the global economy. And um, this is being driven by industrialization. It's being driven by other factors as well. We start to see the growth of export economies. Export economies are countries that produce more than they need, and they produce more than they need on purpose in order to export it, um, in order to sell it to other places. Um, this is going to drive imperialism because one of the justifications for imperialism is going to be that these highly industrialized societies need colonies in order to dump their produced goods onto. It's also going to drive further global integration. It's just going to drive trade, these export economies. Um, I should say also that export economies are not just industrialized societies that are selling finished goods to other areas of the world. They're also the colonies themselves that are being made to produce the raw materials needed, which are then exported to the mother country. So if we think about like India growing cotton and then exporting that cotton to the British so that they could turn that cotton into finished textiles. And then the British would turn around and sell those textiles back to India as well as elsewhere. This has been happening for a long time, but the difference here is the scale of what we're seeing in terms of these export economies. Um, the scale is increasing like never before. So think cotton, rubber, sugar, um, coal, lumber, iron, all of these things, um, as well as finished goods. So it shouldn't surprise us then that industrialization encourages the quest for new markets. And the best way to secure markets for um, industrialized societies, at least they feel at the time, is to take them over. So how can you ensure that a place is going to buy what you're selling? Well, if you take it over and force them to, they have to. So we have to sell those goods, and uh, these two factors combined, the need for natural resources and the quest for new markets, leads us to imperialism. And we see this stylized over here with the political cartoon um, from the time we have England here reaching out and grabbing all of these areas of the world, the Cape Colony, South Africa, Cyprus, Canada, India, Egypt, the devilfish in Egyptian waters. This cartoon is probably from the 1860s, maybe 1870s, when the British are uh, moving into Egypt and they are attempting to take control of the Suez Canal. So this is definitely 1869 or later when the Suez Canal is finished. We'll talk more about that in class. Also, we'll talk more about imperialism in a moment. So to facilitate investment at all levels of industrial production, financiers developed and expanded various financial institutions. And the important thing here is that we see the growth of capitalism and classical liberalism. Um, small l there. Uh, you know what capitalism is. It's, uh, its greatest philosophical proponent is Adam Smith who writes an incredibly influential book in 1776 that's called The Wealth of Nations. And in that book, uh, I'll go back for a second, in that book, Adam Smith argues that the best way to ensure 
productivity and economic growth and success is for the government to stay the heck out of the economy. Adam Smith argues for what's known as the invisible hand, this idea that if you allow people to make their own financial decisions which benefit them, it will also benefit society as a whole. And this is an invisible hand that is guiding the market, that is guiding a country's uh, economy. This stands in contrast to mercantilism, in which economies were heavily state regulated. Adam Smith says, get those regulations out of there. You don't need those regulations. They're unnecessary. John Stuart Mill, we can associate with classical liberalism. Um, classical liberalism, similar to the capitalists, argued that um, the most important thing for a government to do is to protect people's fundamental rights. More on that in a moment. And in order to protect people's fundamental rights the best, government needs to be small. Um, John Stuart Mill and the classical liberals see government as intrusive and controlling. And so they believe that in order to protect people's rights, you need to have small government. It's kind of funny because our liberals today in this country tend to believe the opposite, that in order to protect people's rights, you need big government. Roman numeral four, major developments in transportation and communication, railroads, steamships, telegraphs, canals. These are all during this time period. You plop yourself into the world of 1750. Fastest form of land transportation is the horse. Plop yourself in the world of 1900. You have trains, you have steamships, you have early cars, and you're only three years away from the airplane. Uh, all of these things, I mean, telephone is created during this time period, although it doesn't really become pervasive in this time period. All of these things are going to have huge impacts on globalization and on global integration. So a variety of responses here to the, the spread of global capitalism, excuse me. Uh, workers' organizations, you see unions sprouting up. You also see resistance to change. The Luddites uh, are an example of this resistance to change, L-U-D-D-I-T-E-S. Luddites are a group of workers who see industrialization as threatening their livelihoods. And so they, um, they start destroying machines in, um, in Britain, in early industrial Britain. You'll still hear this term sometimes today. Anyone who is against technological progress can be referred to as a Luddite. And so there are people who resist industrial change. Um, we also see this in large scale in places like um, China and the Ottoman Empire, where they are actively pushing back against industrialization and trying not to industrialize. They see industrialization as threats to tradition, as threats to the way that things were. And they're right to see it that way because industrialization, as we've seen, changes a whole heck of a lot. The problem for these societies is that industrialization um, allows for Europeans and the West to conquer non-industrialized societies and to chip away at their power, like these places. Um, unlike in, in areas like Great Britain, where industrialization just sort of happens, um, without too much help from the government, we do see places where state-sponsored industrialization is happening. These places like uh, Russia, where the Russian government is really actively trying to push for industrialization, um, and Japan during the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, during what's known as the Meiji Restoration. The Japanese government realized it's fallen behind the West, and in order to compete with the West, it's going to have to emulate, it's going to have to copy the West. And they uh, are pretty successful at, at doing that. Um, we also see various types of reform efforts. Industrialization and capitalism brings with it a lot of good for home societies that are industrializing. It also brings with it a lot of bad. You know, large overcrowded cities, poor sanitation, terrible working conditions, shortening lifespan for the working classes. And so we see attempts to reform industrial capital societies, most famously with this guy, Karl Marx, great beard, look at that beard. Marxism, communism, utopianism, trying to create, trying to create like perfect societies, utopian societies. Socialism, where the means of production are controlled by the working classes. These are all attempts to reform industrial capital uh, societies, capitalist societies. Um, 
varying degrees of success. I told you this was a long one. This is the longest key concept. Roman numeral six, um, significant transformations in, in social order due to what's happening here. We see new social classes, the middle class. This is like a 20th century phenomenon, but we start to see a middle class in industrial areas during the 19th century. What we definitely see during the 19th century is the industrial working class. Um, industrialization requires a large workforce and that workforce is uh, referred to as the, the working classes, the, the, large, um, the largest class in uh, most areas that are industrializing. I also see changes in family dynamics and gender roles. I mean, you can see that in this picture right here. Yeah, these are, these are children. These are children, they're probably coal miners. Um, they're leaving the home to work. This is something that never really happened. Children stayed at home, worked on the farm for the most part, or they were apprenticed to a local artisan in town. Now we're seeing children who are going out and working in coal mines, lumber yards, factories. This is a big change in family dynamics. Um, also, women are going to work in numbers that we had never seen before. So we see these changes in gender roles, especially young unmarried women. Uh, unsanitary conditions. Um, in cities, you know, cities are gross places. We take it for granted. Indoor plumbing, trash pickup, drainage, these are all things that cities didn't have um, prior to the Industrial Revolution. And because so many people are moving to cities so quickly and you have things now like factories in the cities that are producing huge amounts of, um, huge amounts of pollution, cities become just disgusting in the, in the 19th century and in, in industrialized places. Um, and the problem with this is not just that they're disgusting, the problem is also disease. Um, because disease spreads when you do things like dump feces in the street, <laughs> which people didn't know at the time. All right, that's it for Key Concept 5.1. It wasn't that bad. It was pretty short. Uh, all right, moving on. Key Concept 5.2, Imperialism. Industrializing powers established transoceanic empires. You're probably saying, yeah, no kidding. We took a look at this in time period four. And you would be correct in that. Um, we could put this statement in time period four minus the industrializing part. You know, we could, we could replace it with colonial or European, something like that. But as I mentioned at the outset, the big difference here is the extent to which colonization is um, able to happen during this time period. So states with existing colonies strengthened their control over these colonies. This is not, in, you know, this is not for all of them. Um, this is British, uh, although they do lose the North American colonies, they strengthen their control over places like the Cape Colony in South Africa, India, Canada. Um, the French similarly are strengthening their control over um, over their colonies um, in places like Northern Africa, the Dutch in the Dutch East Indies, and uh, Germany, which, which is a new colonial power. Um, Germany is starting to um, spread first on the continent and then uh, ultimately beyond the continent into Africa. The United States and Japan also established empires during this time period. The United States kind of close to home with the exception of Guam in the Philippines in the very late 19th century, and Japan is starting to establish an empire with uh, the Korean Peninsula and then expanding further outward. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, not all states with existing colonies strengthened their control. The Spanish and the Portuguese influence really declined rapidly during this time period. The Spanish lose almost all of their colonies during the early 19th century. And the same can be said of the Portuguese, although the Portuguese actually retained colonies into the 21st century. Um, but uh, very few of them, especially compared to, to the areas that they controlled at their height in the early 1500s. Imperialism influenced state formation and contraction, meaning like shrinking around the world. Um, Meiji Japan, the United States, and Russia emulated European transoceanic imperialism. Um, you guys know what emulated means, I think, but, you know, just copied European transoceanic imperialism. And so we no longer have just the old guard Western European powers. We have some new uh, European powers here. And not surprisingly, 
we do see anti-imperialism as well, and we see this in the contraction of the, the Ottoman Empire too. So new states developed on the edges of existing empires. Um, and this is kind of, this is more kind of concept 5.3 when we look at how um, states revolt and rebel during this time period. And they, um, so colonies create new states, you know, like British North America becomes United States or um, South America, which was, you know, New Spain becomes all these different countries. Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, um, St. Dominique, the French colony becomes Haiti. So um, that process we see as well. And um, the development and spread of nationalism as an ideology fostered these new communal identities. Um, we'll talk about nationalism in class. I, you know, I hope nationalism is something that you understand. When you do the Pledge of Allegiance every day, you're pledge, pledging allegiance to one nation. Um, a nation is a group of people who believe themselves to be common in some ways. You know, they share things in common. Language, history, institutions, religion. It doesn't have to be all of them, but it, it has to be some of them. And so um, the, the idea of a nation is really, really powerful um, during this time period. Prior to this, you were united by a king. You were subjects of a king or a queen or an emperor. The people of a nation believe themselves to be united, not by someone, but for themselves. And this fosters new communal identities and it fosters, it fosters revolt, it fosters revolution. Um, and we see that in our country. We don't have to look far. Um, so when we're looking at justifications for imperialism, we should look at um, racial ideologies. Europeans believed themselves to be racially superior to the people who they were colonizing, who they were taking over. Um, we see this in our own country, United States, our view of Native Americans, our view of um, African Americans as former slaves. We see this in Japan, their view of being superior to ethnic Koreans and Chinese. Um, and so we do see these racial ideologies. Um, social Darwinism is just like an attempt to define these, these racial, um, these racist thoughts as scientific. It's um, playing off of Darwin's idea of evolution and natural selection, the idea that only the strong survive in evolutionary biology. Social Darwinists are taking this idea and they're perverting it. You know, they're saying, well, only the strong survive in the world. And so because we have better guns, because we have uh, better military technology, we're the strongest. And so our survival means we're the fittest. And anyone who is too weak to stand up to us deserves to be colonized. Um, so that's, that's social Darwinism. And so here we have the, um, the world in, in 1750. I just want you to, to note, you know, these areas here, these are all colonies. Um, British, French is blue, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, also notice, you know, we have Ottoman Empire here, huge swaths of Africa, not, not colonized, you know, only along the coasts and the, and the tip. Um, and if, if we were to accelerate this to 1900, um, we see a lot of change. I mean, we see new countries around here. You know, these are all new countries. There are no, no more colonies, um, you know, no more large colonies. The Caribbean is still colonized to this day in many places, but, um, and we still have a few colonies, but um, Africa is the other big thing. I mean, these, the entirety of Africa is controlled by Europeans, um, with the exception of, of Ethiopia. And um, I guess they're saying Morocco and Tripoli, but I don't, I don't really buy that. Um, Ottoman Empire, like it barely exists now. It's, you know, it's just confined to, to here. I mean, just massive, massive changes. Um, that we see on, on this map. And that's, that's imperialism, right? That's imperialism. So there you go. I, you know, really short notes, only about seven minutes. Imperialism is so, so important. We're going to spend tons of time talking about it in class, but I just wanted to give you the basics there. So you can pause it for now and come on back when you're ready for Key Concept 5.3. Um, okay, here we go. Key Concept 5.3, Revolutions and Nationalism. So, um, the Enlightenment, 
is housed here by the College Board. Um, the Enlightenment is a um, philosophical tradition. It's a philosophical movement that starts in France, in uh, Paris, and it's all about questioning. You know, the Enlightenment actually has its roots in time period four, um, with thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and, and John Locke, who are from the 17th century. But the Enlightenment as a movement is really going to be in the, in the 18th century, which I think is why College Board puts it here. Um, this is all about new ways of understanding the world. Um, and the way that Enlightenment thinkers seek to understand the world is through reason, not faith. This is a challenge to religious doctrine, many of them thousands of years old. Enlightenment thinkers say you should be able to explain the world around you based on reason, scientific inquiry, scientific method um, is, is during this, now well, it's 17th century, so it's kind of pre, pre this time period. But, um, and this leads to new political ideas. You know, the importance of the individual. Here we have John Locke. Um, who was actually living during the, the late 17th century, very, very influential um, Enlightenment thinker. Uh, he says the individual is you know, incredibly important to a society. In the past, individuals were just subjects of the king or the emperor. Um, individuals are the individual components that make up the nation state. The idea of natural rights, this is Voltaire. Voltaire, um, a very prolific writer, during the Enlightenment, also a strong critic of organized religion and a supporter of uh, natural rights. This idea that when we are born, we are born with, with rights um, that are inherent. They are a part of us. They cannot be removed from us. You can have people like kings or emperors who are despotic and try to take our rights from us, but um, we are in fact born with rights. And uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's this guy right here, is most closely associated with the idea of the social contract that um, people and rulers enter into a social contract. The ruler pledges to protect the people. The people in turn pledge to respect and obey the ruler. The important thing here is that it is a contract and the contract can be broken by both sides. And rulers can break the social contract, if the ruler is no longer protecting the people, if a ruler is no longer protecting the people's natural rights, then the people have uh, the right to revolt. I mean, this is where the social contract ultimately takes us in terms of thinking. And so, not surprisingly, the Enlightenment encourages resistance to authority. If you're being encouraged to question, and if you're being encouraged to question everything, you're of course going to come into conflict with authority because authority doesn't want you to question anything um, because questioning makes it more difficult for authority to wield that authority. You know, if you want an example here, just look at school. You know, the what's the relationship between teachers and students? If students start questioning too much, it makes it more difficult for the teachers to execute their authority in the classroom. Why do I have to do these assignments? Why is this assignment worth these points? Why are you the teacher in charge? Why do you get to tell me, the student, what to do? I mean, as a teacher, these are questions that <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't like um, because they encourage challenges to our authority. Now, that's not to say that these questions don't have answers. Oftentimes they do, which is why the paradigm exists, which is why I am a teacher and you are students. Um, but that's not to say that the question shouldn't be asked and the Enlightenment thinkers should say, would say that the question should absolutely be asked. And if the rulers or those in authority can't come up with good answers, then you need to start looking at these things here. It, what's, what's the social contract? What are my rights? Have they been broken? And what can I do about it? The American Declaration, if we're talking about historical examples, is, is a great example of this. Yeah, I mean, the American Declaration is, hey, King George, you broke the social contract. You, you know, you, you have been taxing us unfairly. You have been quartering your soldiers in our homes. Um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You have not encouraged those things in the colonies. And so we are declaring independence. See the same thing in the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which we'll take a look at in class.
And so we see challenges to existing social institutions like the church, you know, like uh, religion. The Catholic Church is under fire during this time period. Women advocating for suffrage. Suffrage is the right to vote. Challenging a patriarchal society. Why are men the ones who are always in power? Why don't women have the same political rights as men? You know, all men are created equal is the language. Um, not all people. Why is that? So women begin to challenge existing social institutions. Also, slavery is challenged. You know, why do some people get the right to enslave others? If everyone is born with natural rights, doesn't that mean that slavery cannot exist? I mean, these are really uncomfortable questions that are being asked um, at the time. And that's the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is all about questioning. It's all about questioning. And so um, you couple this with the rise of nationalism, which is this, people developing a new sense of commonality based on language, religion, social customs, and territory. Um, we start to see pretty large-scale political change and upheavals. Um, sometimes governments use this idea to unite diverse populations. Sometimes nationalism was a, a force for destruction, a force for change. Places ripped themselves apart um, based on their beliefs. Nationalism can change. You know, nationalism can evolve, right? Um, in the United States, 1780s were one country. 1860s, U.S. Civil War, well, maybe we're actually two countries. Maybe the North and the South are actually two separate nations um, with different social customs, for example, with different territory. Uh, and then we fight the Civil War. No, we're actually one place. Um, nationalism is fluid. Nationalism can change. We should remember that about nationalism. Roman numeral three, uh, revolutionary movements, increasing discontent with imperial rule, propelling reformist and revolutionary change. Challenges to centralized imperial authority. The French Revolution is a great example. The Taiping Rebellion in China in the 1860s is a great example. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's tons and tons of examples from this time period. The Latin American revolutions are a great example of this. The reason I, I put these two up here is because these two revolutions or rebellions are happening from within a country. A lot of the revolutions and rebellions that we see during this time period are colonial peoples revolting against their home country. But the French Revolution and the Taiping Rebellion are different in some ways. It's it's the people, you know, it's the people here trying to seize power for themselves, um, not against a foreign foe. You know, in the American Revolution, the American revolutionaries begin to see the British as a foreign foe. Although that process does take time. A lot of American people see themselves as British. And so that process does take time. But the difference here is that, the, you know, the French Revolution, the Taiping Rebellion, the Chinese peasants are revolting against a Chinese government. And so that's, that's different than um, Latin Americans rebelling against a Spanish government or Creoles in Latin America rebelling against peninsulares. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's a little bit different than what we're seeing in places like the British colonies, uh, the Haitian Revolution, where you have um, slaves in the French colony of Saint Dominique who are rising up against their white masters and who are revolting against them and and massacring them um, in the Latin American independence movement. So we can we can kind of break these down into these two different categories here when we're talking about discontent with imperial rule. And that's it. Key concept 5.3. There is so much to unpack in there, um, but we'll do that in class. And uh, yeah, we'll do that in class. So here we go. Key concept 5.4, the last one. I promise this one is short. I think it might only be one slide. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's only one slide. Um, so we're talking about global migration here. So migration in many cases was influenced by changes in um, demography in both industrialized and unindustrialized societies that presented challenges to existing patterns of living. I mean, migration is not new, um, but what's happening is because <clears throat> industrialization is changing so much, not just in industrialized societies, but in non-industrialized societies and colonies, for example, that migration, um, the, the patterns change to some extent. 
You see a significant rise in the global population during this time period. The Colombian exchange still going on. You also have an agricultural revolution that's happening in the, in the 19th century. You see the fruits of in, industrialization. Some of them are more efficient means of farming. And so now you have this situation where farmland can produce more in a shorter amount of time than ever before. And so we have an agricultural revolution healthier crops, shorter grow time, more crops per field uh, is going to lead to a significant rise in the global population, although not nearly as significant as what we see in the 20th century in time period six. Also, improvements in transportation allow for people to move uh, over larger geographic distances in, in shorter amounts of time. Um, I didn't put it up here, but like railroad is a good example of this. You know, people can move thousands of miles in like a week, that's a pretty big deal. Steamships, more reliable, efficient transportation. Canals as well. Um, you know, you can move from Great Britain to India in in like, you know, uh, a, a matter of weeks by the time you get to 1900, a journey that would have taken you six months in 1750. Um, urbanization, so, you know, 1900, two out of 10 people are living in an urban area, and that's that's more than in 1750. I don't know exactly how many more. It's probably one in 10 in 1750, something like that. And we can see now the acceleration of, of urbanization. We live in a world today, we passed this milestone in 2010, where more than half of the world's population lives in an urban area. And this is a trend that is that is continuing. And so we do see increasing urbanization during this time period. And people are moving to cities. I mean, that's migration right there. Um, migrants are relocating for a variety of reasons. Um, they are searching for work, coerced labor. We still have slavery during this time period, although it is ending uh, as a large-scale practice. Slavery still exists in the modern world, but it's ending as a large-scale accepted practice. You also have people who are just trying to survive, who are trying to escape really difficult situations. Irish potato famine is a good example of this. Ireland loses 25% of its population to immigration. I think that's the statistic. 25% of its population to immigration because of the Irish potato famine. I mean, complete demographic collapse. So you have people who are just trying to survive, who are trying to get out of really bad situations. Um, and they're in search of new opportunities. And sometimes these opportunities aren't just work. Sometimes these opportunities are, are survival. Um, it's important to note that because of these improvements to transportation, this immigration that we're seeing is not always permanent. We start to see seasonal immigration, even like transoceanic seasonal immigration, because people can now uh, leave one country, you know, a couple weeks by sea, they're in another country, they stay there for six months, and then they return home. Many um, do stay permanently, though. So, you know, variety of consequences and reactions to increasingly diverse societies um, on the part of both migrants and the existing populations. If we think about migrants, migrants coming to new places often try to hold on to their new, uh, sorry, hold on to their traditional beliefs and practices and cultures. Um, so, you know, the United States is a good example. We have like, you know, Chinatowns in cities. We have little Italys in cities. You have these ethnic enclaves where migrants would tend to, um, to try to cluster, you know, they would they would feel like they were still back in in the old country where they came from. Um, but you also see from migrants a um, an acculturation process where they are also taking elements of their new societies and making them their own. Um, so they're like you know forming new religious practices or beliefs. I think the best way to see this is in terms of food, you know, in terms of uh, how migrant populations take elements of food from where they came from, but they use the ingredients that are available to them in new places, which is where you get like, you know, Italian American cuisine, for, for example. Um, and so I, th I think that's a good example of how migrants are both trying to retain their old beliefs and values, but they're also adapting to their new situation. Existing populations also um, had a variety of reactions to migrants. Oftentimes migrants were met with abuse. Migrants were met with derision and suspicion. Migrants were not really treated well. Migrants were treated as outsiders by existing populations. Um, and we see this the world over. Racism is not just something that is um, 
uniquely American or European, racism exists everywhere where you have people who are others, quotes around others. And so migrants oftentimes who were in search of new opportunities, they were relatively poor people, they were desperate people, and they showed up to their new lands and they were viewed as such, they were viewed as poor and desperate. And this did not mean empathy, this did not mean that they got uh, help in a lot of instances. In a lot of instances, they were pushed to the margins of societies. And so I think, oh, is that it? Yeah, that's it for Key Concept 5.4. All right, nice job today. See you in class.